Hey there guys, Headphones Neil here, back with another um, TV and film review, and in this case it's going to be a combination of the TV show Stargate SG-1 Season 8 and the sequel film Stargate Continuum. So the reason I'm doing this particular review is because they, for the most part, flow into each other very well. Um, the only parts that don't really flow are... Um, items like some of the team members and characters, so you get um, General Landry, you get um, Colonel Shepard, uh, more from uh, Vala Maldoran who plays Katesh, but if you watch it in like this, it kind of serves as a transition into seasons 9 and 10 and kind of, um, and I think, I want to say that season 9 would then kind of for form as a uh, prequel to the film so that way you get more information on um, who they are and uh, you work your way into the Ori story arc and then season 10 um, rounds it out and then you finish with the arc of truth which I want to kind of say is going to fit in between seasons 9 and 10 but um, I'm still researching all of that but that's neither here nor there. So with Stargate SG-1 we have um Colonel O'Neill having been promoted to General O'Neill and now running Stargate Command. Um, you have um, Cap um, Major Carter or Major Carter now as Colonel Carter, so she's kind of the de facto leader of SG One, but not really. Um, and kind of there's changes going on. It's kind of business as usual, but we kind of see the day ins and outs of Stargate Command from the perspective of General O'Neill and. He kind of sees how um, tiring and difficult it is to run it and the pressures he put on General Hammond and the pressures that General Hammond himself were under from various, um, not necessarily threats, but distractions like political distractions, rogue groups like the NID and all of that. So overall, kind of just we're dealing with the fallout from defeating the ghouls for the most part via Anubis. Um, the replicators are on the threat of, are are on the threat of defeating the, the Asgard. But basically, the idea here is that we are building the Jaffa Nation, so that's a good point. And while it feels convenient to have made Dakara the um, Jaffa homeworld, but then also or in the birth of the Jaffa, but also have a weapon to defeat the replicators, it kind of worked that because the Jaffa were created, the replicators were also created there, so the weapon would be there to provide a means of defeating the replicators. So overall, the season kind of deals with that transition in Stargate Command, but also defeating the final defeat of the Gould system lords and the replicators via the weapon that Colonel O'Neill first um, created. So, um, even if they ended the series here and then you, we jump right into Stargate Continuum to, um, defeat Ball's plan, it would have been fine. So the Ori story arc was good as a means of introducing the Ancients. So if they did not do Stargate Atlantis, then Stargate SG-1 would have been a good transition. But, um, I kind of don't, or I kind of feel like this is a good end to SU1 because you have General O'Neill be promoted and then end up le end up retiring and then SU1 kind of falls apart in then in season nine. So it's one of those things where it would have been better to have the Ori story arc be rolled into Stargate Atlantis as far as um, the le next level from the Wraith or. Uh, when I watch the seasons, we'll see if that kind of um, the transition makes sense where they are slowly transitioning um, into Stargate Atlantis. And as you can tell, that because I'm talking so little about SG-1 Season 8, that it wasn't necessarily a full season worth of content. It was more the last few episodes kind of worked out to have the Jaffa take over to Kara in order to reclaim a, a planet of significance in order to at rebuild it or to build the Jaffa Nation, which is good. And then we see Stargate Command kind of getting into their own groove that they know that random things are going to happen. They're going to take it in stride and um, they'll deal, deal with threats as they come because they 
they now have intergalactic experience and they know how to deal with threats large and small as they come. Um, so with that, as far as Stargate Continuum goes, it works best here, in my opinion, as I mentioned, because it transitions a team from being led by Colonel O'Neill into being led by Colonel Shepard and then Stargate Command being led by General Landry. So it introduces those characters and allows General O'Neill to retire. Um, and then we also get the introduction of Vala Maldoran to join the t um, team of SG-1. But we know that something is up, she's kind of shifty, can she be trusted, can she not be trusted, and that sort of thing. So um, that's why it kind of works as a stepping stone here. Um, so once I get into Season 9, 10, and Arc of Truth, we'll see how that all falls into place and if it works. But um, Stargate Continuum essentially solidifies that the idea that the Gould are no longer a threat because Ball had enacted a plan to go back in time to prevent the humans from getting the Stargate, so it would have ideally made for an easier um, takeover of the planet. But because um, Carter, Shepard, and Daniel Jackson are able to get through the Stargate in time, they're able to save their... or preserve the timeline, albeit kind of clunkily, but overall it generally just works. And because we've had time travel experience notably towards the end of season eight what by the team going back in time to get a zero point module it kind of all works out that way but it, it keeps the idea in mind that um messing with timelines is very dangerous and um messing with too many things can have more repercussions than can be intended so that's all there is for this particular review so with that, I'm going to jump right into Season um, 9 of SG-1, but in this case, rather than doing a season-by-season -season review, um, I'm going to watch Seasons 9 and 10, and the second sequel, technically Continuum, Continuum was the second sequel, but this is but Arc of Truth is the first sequel, so you can see why it's kind of weird there, but I'm going to watch all three at the same, Seasons 9, 10, and 10 at the same time, along with Arc of Truth to round out the Ori storyline all at once. Um, I haven't decided if I'm going to... As far as I can tell, Arc of Truth makes sense after Season 10 because it resolves what happens to the Ori Empire, but I'll see how it how the end of Season 9 works out in order to solve that, but I might just do 9, 10, and Arc of Truth to keep it simple there, so look out for that coming soon. Um... But that is all for this particular review, so if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, or anything like that, you can find me on Twitter at PatelN01. The website's PatelN01.com for past episodes, code subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. But thanks for tuning in to this particular review, and until next time. <laughs>